Over 100 million copies of it have been sold. It's one of the biggest best-selling book franchises of all time and it's quintessentially British. Except it's not. This book, The Tale of Peter Rabbit and its sequels, were written by the acclaimed author Beatrix Potter. But thanks to some eagle-eyed researchers, we now know that Beatrix Potter stole her plot lines, sayings, language and even the very idea of a mischievous country rabbit from Africans specifically African Americans and Caribbean people. We know she stole it because researchers have gained access to her secret diaries in which she admits to the origin of her famous Peter Rabbit stories. But what does it matter where she got her ideas from? Who cares anyhow? She died almost a hundred years ago. Well, what better way to answer questions about one of the world's most famous storytellers than with our own story? Like and subscribe ladies and gentlemen, and let's get into it. That story starts with these people, the Gullahs. Gullah folk are the descendants of people from West and Central Africa sold during the transatlantic slave trade and brought over to America as slaves. Watch our video on these amazing people and you'll find out just how white American settlers used Gullah genius and know-how to build the American South. Link in the video description below. But back when these Africans first arrived in the Americas, one of the many things they brought with them to places like Georgia, the Carolinas and even the Caribbean was their creative storytelling. Pre-industrialization, African civilizations lived side by side with nature and you'll find the natural world all over our folktales. In fact, you'll be hard pressed to find African folktales that have no reference to a totemic animal or some primordial force of nature. Gullahs brought this heritage with them to the American South, vivid and colorful stories which often centered around the adventures of a particular mischievous animal. The animal was often an underdog, not particularly powerful, big or even beautiful to look at, but what the animal lacked in brawn, it's often made up for in brains. Take the Ashanti people of Ghana and their stories of Anansi the spider. One of the smallest, most inconsequential creatures you can think of is the hero of most of their folk stories, a spider. Not the elephant, not the leopard, but a spider. But what does this have to do with Beatrix Potter? Well, for the Yorubas of Nigeria, the equivalent animal in their stories was often the tortoise. This slowest, ugliest looking of all animals regularly outwitted the pride of the plains, the lion and all his other subjects. But in many other Yoruba tales, the mischief maker is the hare or the forest rabbit. Small, cuddly and a tasty meal for almost everything else in the jungle. Yet, somehow in these stories, the rabbit always managed to use his smarts to outwit all the other much larger animals of the jungle. If somehow you still can't see where this is going, then let's head back across the Atlantic to America. Because there, against all odds, the Gullahs thrived in the south and so do their African folktales. That's precisely because these stories were perfect for the environments the Gullahs found themselves in. The rabbit, ever the underdog in a world of predators, was a perfect parallel for enslaved people and their relationship with their white masters. To say Gullah life was tough is as big an understatement as you can get, with Gullah slaves often having to outsmart their white masters just to get food on which to survive on. But it's the name that Gullahs and other descendants of enslaved people gave to their animal character that starts us off on the rabbit trail which leads to this innocent looking lady from the north of England. In Francophone Louisiana, blacks called the mischief making hero of their folk stories compare Lapin, that's brother rabbit in English, which is exactly what Gullah folk in Georgia and the Carolinas called their version. Or, as they say in Gola Creole, Brer Rabbit. Is it clicking yet? That's Brer Rabbit, as in this wisecracking guy, the famed rabbit from Disney's notorious Song of the South. But like many things Walt Disney was famous for, Song of the South and the infamous Uncle Remus wasn't an original idea. Both belong to this guy, Joel Chandler Harris, whose book Songs and Sayings first featured the character Uncle Remus. Inspired by the time he spent with black communities in Georgia, Chandler's Uncle Remus was supposed to be based on any one of the many black storytellers he had listened to who would gather the community around a fire to tell stories of Brer Rabbit and his adventures. 
Uncle Remus was Harris's way of giving back to the people who had inspired him to write his best-selling and popular series of books. Sayings and Songs and its sequel, Night with Uncle Remus, were loved all over America. President Roosevelt in 1905 is supposed to have said, Presidents may come and presidents may go, but Uncle Remus stays put. Georgia has done a great many things for the Union, but she has never done more than when she gave Mr. Joe Chandler Harris to American literature. All these accolades are despite the fact that as far as children's stories go, Brer Rabbit tales were quite brutal and dark. Why? Well, because that was the existence of enslaved peoples of the South, dark and brutal, with the consequences of crossing your master as serious as lynching or being flogged to death. Stories about a cute and clever little rabbit using his wits to survive a harsh environment was some of the best comic relief enslaved black people used to get through their own hard existence. And as the book sales got higher, so did Uncle Remus and Brer Rabbit's popularity, opening a window for many American whites into the life of African Americans. Before Uncle Remus became a reductionist stereotype of blacks, Harris's work early on helped to humanize black folks and make white Americans realize the creativity and wit of the black people they were living side by side with. But it wasn't just Americans who were reading Harris's songs and sayings. In England, a reclusive teenage girl by the name of Beatrix Potter was too. Beatrix Potter was born into a very wealthy English family. On both sides, she came from what we today might call Big Cotton. Her grandfather, Edmund Potter, was a Manchester cotton mill industrialist, owning what became the world's largest calico printing mill by the late 1800s. Her mother was a cotton heiress whose own family owned several large cotton mills. These mills were often the workhouses in which impoverished Victorian children were forced to work in, a practice lambasted by Charles Dickens in almost all of his novels. But the shady sources of the Potter wealth don't stop there. For decades, even after the end of slavery, the cotton sourced by both sides of the Potter empire came from the unremunerated labor of blacks in the American South. It's from here that Professor Emily Zobel Marshall of Leeds University believes Beatrix's father, Rupert Potter, would have acquired the Brer Rabbit books which came into his large library. Copies of Harris's Brer Rabbit folktale collections bearing her father's book plates were found at Beatrix Potter's own home in the Lake District after she died in 1943. Marshall claims that, quote, these stories had not been published in the UK when Beatrix Potter was a child. It is therefore likely that her early contacts with the Brer Rabbit Tales, in comparison with the rest of the British public, was a result of her family roots in the cotton industry, end quote. And as Linda Lear's 2008 biography of Potter claims, a young and reclusive Beatrix Potter, who barely left the care of her governess, came to be influenced by Harris's Uncle Remus stories, whose Brer Rabbit stories she had loved as a child. Okay, so what? She had a few copies of a popular book. Is that all? No, there's more. Years later, as an adult, Potter was thinking of a character to cheer up her former governess's convalescent child and she created her unforgettable character, Peter Rabbit. If you're English, heck if you've ever read storybooks to children, you can't have missed Peter Rabbit, the mischief-making rabbit always busy stealing carrots from Mr. McGregor's garden patch and outwitting far bigger countryside animals than himself. And if you've never read a Peter Rabbit book, well, in 2018, Hollywood produced a big-budget movie adaptation of his adventures. And yet, Columbia and Sony Pictures were only following in the footsteps of the incredibly shrewd Miss Beatrix. See, after an initial lack of success in the early 20th century, the Peter Rabbit books took off. Took off is an understatement. Peter Rabbit was like the Harry Potter of its day. And the already well-heeled Beatrix Potter made sure to milk that baby for all it was worth. There were board games, memorabilia, even Peter Rabbit dolls, 
and Beatrix was not about to let anybody leech off her success in the slightest. She once wrote to a fellow author whose work had a striking similarity to some of hers, accusing him of having, quote, no originality and telling him there were no coincidences to the similarities between her work and his. Now you might be forgiven for thinking someone like that would give a bit of shine to the blacks of Georgia, just like Joel Chandler Harris did. Or at least credit him, a fellow white author. Not at all. Not even when some of her own plot lines involving Peter Rabbit were lifted directly out of Harris's stories. Enid Blyton of the famous Five fame, who would also later write stories based on the Br'er Rabbit stories, would in her book pay homage to quote, the American Negro's friend and brother creature. But not Beatrix Potter, not even with whole plot lines and sentences lifted from Harris's Br'er Rabbit stories. Here's what Dr. Zobel Marshall, literature professor at Leeds University, says. Quote, in Some Lady's Garden, for example, Br'er Rabbit tricks Miss Janie into letting him into her father's vegetable garden to steal English peas, asparagus and peanuts by pretending to be a friend of her father, Mr. Man, from the big white master's house. This plot is the main storyline in most of Potter's tales and is directly linked to the need for enslaved people to steal food from their masters to survive. But her tale of Mr. Todd is the one most clearly based on Harris's narratives. Its plot centers on overcoming neighborhood bullies, the badger Tommy Brock and the fox Mr. Todd. In her biography of Potter, Linda Lear explains that she copied the tale out from Uncle Remus, then changed the setting to the Lake District's Sorry countryside. End quote. But even whole sentences were lifted from Harris's Uncle Remus tales. Listen to this one, taken from A Night with Uncle Remus. They hear the chairs are falling, and the table turning over, and the crockery breaking, and then they the flood open, and out come Brad Fox a squalling like the old boy was after him. Now compare with Potter's version. Quote, There was a terrific battle all over the kitchen. Everything was upset except the kitchen table. The crockery was smashed to atoms. The chairs were broken. Close quote. Now, nobody's slamming Beatrix Potter for taking inspiration from the stories of African Americans. Writers take inspiration from the world around them and from others all the time. But when your work is so heavily based on someone else's to the tune of whole storylines and sentences, how can you live with yourself while the money and accolades come in and you never once mention the basis for your inspiration, instead claiming that you quote, make these stories? Answer, it's because you're doing more than taking inspiration, you're stealing whole terms alien to the genteel and tea-sipping society Beatrix Potter came from were taken from Harris's own imitation of black Americans. Again, Zobel Marshall says this, quote, Terms like rabbit tobacco, puddle duck, lickety split, and cottontail are not English at all, but have been lifted from the African-American vernacular she learned and enjoyed in the Remus tales, close quote. This woman literally took African-American words and put them in a story about a rabbit from the Lake District in England and nobody has ever asked why. In fact, reporter Lucy Knight in The Guardian says, quote, Before Zobo Marshall's essay and book American Trickster, Trauma, Tradition and Br'er Rabbit, there had only been two detailed pieces of research connecting Potter's tales with Harris's earlier folk tales. One was in the children's author John Goldthwaite's 1996 book, The Natural History of Make-Believe, and the other was literary critic Peter Hollandale's unpublished lecture, Uncle Remus and Peter Rabbit, at the Beatrix Potter Society's 2003 annual general meeting. Close quote. Now that is one brave man. Can't imagine too many rounds of applause for him at that event. But if you think this is all the evidence there is that Potter was playing the role of a sneaky little culture vulture, you couldn't be more wrong. Listen to what she wrote to publishers when trying to sell them her book. Quote, I think the story is amusing. Its principal defect is its imitation of Uncle Remus. It is no drawback for children because they cannot read the Negro vernacular. 
I hardly think the publishers could object to it. I wrote it some time ago. I've copied it out lately. Close quote. Wow. Just wow. But what now? If you haven't noticed, the trickster animal motif didn't end with Beatrix Potter. Hollywood and American Entertainment took it and ran with it. If you were a child throughout pretty much the whole of the television era before the rise of YouTube and social media, you'll obviously remember Bugs Bunny, Tom and Jerry and Roadrunner. The most obvious parallel of these three is Bugs Bunny. Complete with minstrel gloves, the creators of this iconic character obviously hailed not too far from the Peter and Brer Rabbit traditions which owe their very existence to the stories told by the charismatic storytellers of the black diaspora. Ever wondered why the perils round the corner for Bugs, Jerry and Roadrunner were often quite gruesome? Or why the comeuppance for their antagonists is a little too harsh for children's daytime cartoons? It's because the perils for the American slave were just as gruesome and so was the comeuppance for Br'er Rabbit's antagonists, Br'er Fox and Br'er Bear. The slaves could only dream of the violence Br'er Rabbit's enemies often got being dealt on their own masters. So dream they did with their stories. And speaking of Tom and Jerry, why was this ever anonymous black maid always making cameos? Get in here, tiger man, and get yourself a nice big bowl of delicious cream. Thomas, why you two time and double crossing? No good cheap cat. It's a nod to the black and southern origins of the tropes the cartoon was based on. Constantly, blacks across the world have this ridiculous claim to contend with, that we contributed nothing to human history, culture and civilization. Now, we have thick skin. History and our melanin testifies to that much. But imagine every time you turn around to prove those contributions, you also have to compete with people like Miss Beatrix, who work so darn hard to make sure your contributions are locked away in the shadows while they make all the money and all the hay. Pun intended. But hey, like was said earlier, we have thick skins. Matter of fact, let Brer Rabbit say it for us. Yes, sir, Brother Fox. I was born and bred in the brown patch. <laughs> From Cush to Compton, we're staying trill and black.